Okay, can you see the slides now? Yes, Prof. Fantastic. Yes, we can see. Okay, great. So motivation from concept or from theory to application, how we apply it from theory to application. All right. So another way uh, with regards to uh, applying uh, motivation uh, in terms of theory to application is the use of uh, what you call management by objectives. Management by objectives. Management by objective was actually propounded by uh, the management guru uh, known as uh, Peter Drunker. Peter Drunker. Peter Drunker has contributed enormously uh, to, to management philosophy. And of course, uh, uh, according to the perspective with regards to uh, management by objective, which is also known as MBO. MBO simply means a program that encompasses or encompasses specific goals with participatively, which is participatively set for an explicit time period with feedback on goals. A program that encompasses the specific goals. There must be goal specificity. You see, there must be goal specificity so that we know exactly what the goal is all about. That is the emphasis of MBO. And of course, that this goal should be participatively set. That is to say that people must participate in setting this goal. Employees can be part of the participant in terms of cutting at this goal for an explicit time period, for a given time period, MBO has specific time to actually accomplish the goal then with feedback on goal progress. There should be in between feedbacks on goal progress, how we are progressing. And of course, uh, uh, there is a perception that this can also be used to motivate employees. But well, this can be a kind of motivation for employees. Of course, key elements to MBO include goal specificity, participative decision-making, and of course, an explicit time period when that goal should be completed, and of course, uh, performance feedback. Uh, there should be performance uh, feedback. All right. So you can see how MBO, uh, uh, MBO is uh, actually uh, 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 carried out in an organization with regards to management by objective. You can see the overall organizational objective is at the top, taking at the top management, which is of course a, a complete S, Y, Z. And in fact, when we try to relate it to the current position of human resources, uh, of course, human resources now have been brought to the top management, to be part of the top management decision-making hierarchy. That also contribute to participation. That those who, of course, uh, deal with the subordinate, deal with employee, must also contribute in decision-making. So you can see now the decision is made at the top there, at the, top, uh, at the company's uh, top management or 
uh, at the company, then it is, cascade, it is cascaded to divisional objective. For instance, you can see the two division there, consumer product division and industrial product division. That is for that cascaded. So the information, the objective have to be related. So the consumer product have to make sure that the objective is tied to the organizational objective. And of course, the consumer product, and of course, uh, product uh, industrial product division. From there, it moved to the departmental uh, 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 functional area. You can see the production, sales, customer, then of course, in the industrial product division, marketing, research, development. So of course, this objective is still being cascaded down, can you see? And of course, up to the bottom line, that is individual objective. So there must be a connection, there must be a linkage, there must be an alignment between the, 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 between the objective that is, take, that is made at the top, the purpose, and of course, that of the bottom line, can you see? That is what uh, uh, management by objective is all about, you know? that uh, there must be a kind of alignment between the objective coming from the top and of course, the objective of all those below the top, can you see? So that, that is exactly what the diagram is alluding to. Right. Now linkage, linking MBO and goal setting theory. We are spoken about goal setting theory. How do you link them? Uh, there are there are ways you can, of course, uh, 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 show some comparison between both of them. With regards to MBO, uh, when it comes to goal specificity, yes, definitely there is goal specificity. Uh, there is goal specificity with regards to MBA, and of course, goal specificity with regards to goal setting theory of motivation. Now, when we talk about goal difficulty, yes. The goals are difficult goals, uh, which is of course uh, uh, a goal that can of course motivate uh, 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 an employee to use his brain to a certain extent, instead of just simplifying goals. Uh, difficult uh, goal difficulty, yes. In terms of MBO goal difficulty, in terms of goal setting theory, yes, of course. Now with regards to feedback, of course, with regards to MBO, definitely yes. And of course, with regard to goal setting theory, uh, the same thing. Now, with regards to participation, which in terms of MBO, participation is allowed. So MBO, yes, but with regards to goal setting theory, uh, uh, participation is not allowed. So that is the only area where there seems to be uh, a difference between uh, MBO, management by objective, and of course, uh, a goal setting theory of motivation. All right. Why MBOs fail? Or uh, why has MBO failed? Why MBOs failed? I see. The first one that is uh, unrealistic expectations about MBO re results. There's a perception that there is unrealistic expectation. The expectation that they want to achieve is unrealistic. No, no, nobody is sure. Okay, you see. Then the second one is lack of commitment by top management. Of course, top management speaks about MBO, but top management sometimes don't commit to it. Okay, you see. Sometimes top management, for instance, may take a single-handed decision without involving others to participate. So that lack of commitment has of course made them be to fail also. And management may not be serious about it. Another reason why MBA is failure to allocate reward properly. Can you see? The benefit that accrues from MBA, at times sometimes management fails in terms of proper allocation of rewards. So that of course has also affected the success of MBA. Another aspect is cultural incompatibility. 
and the, uh, the process may not be, of course, compatible with certain culture. Can you see? For instance, America culture, which is more individualistic, may not, in fact, prefer participating in decision making. So these are just uh, some of the areas why, where MBA can fail, or why, or why MBA fail in certain in certain places. Can you see? So that is that. All right. Now, in terms of, apart from motivation, uh, apart from other aspects of motivation, in terms of practice, that are a kind of uh, uh, monetary in nature or that are extrinsic in nature, we have also other motivation approach, which is, of course, like employee recognition program. Can you see? Employee recognition program, where personal attention is given to a particular employee that has, uh, of course, performed excellently. And of course, employees also uh, invited to uh, express interest in uh, some of the activities of the organization. And of course, employees are also appreciated for job well done through employee recognition program. That can be a source of motivation for employees, right? So benefit of program, benefit of employee uh, uh, recognition program. The first one that, that is for free employee desire for recognition. For free employees desire for recognition. If employees recognize in the organization, it fulfills their desire to be recognized. And it falls even into higher order needs or need for actualization. Thank you. I gave you an instance when uh, I received a certificate from Nelson Mandela to this foundation. That's why the fact that it is not money, that I feel very, very fulfilled. Can you see? President Nelson Mandela was somebody I started hearing about when I was even a little boy in prison. We have danced a lot of music about Free Mandela, Free Mandela, all across Africa. Now receiving a certificate from him, you know, I felt very fulfilled, you know, that somehow there was a connection to this great icon, you see. So for free employee desire for the recognition. Then another one is uh, encourages reputation of desire behavior. And you see, when you recognize employees, whether by praising, by praising an employee, I was giving an example how mothers can praise children first, elogize them before uh, you send them some message and they cannot uh, refuse, you know. When you encourage them, when you kind of uh, recognize them, either in terms of certificate, in terms of thanks, in terms of uh, tapping their backs and say, oh, you did well, keep, keep up the good work it encourages that person to repeat the desired behavior. Another benefit of employee recognition program is it enhances groups of team cohesiveness and motivation. It enhances group or team cohesiveness or motivation. You see? Another aspect, benefit of uh, the program is that it encourages employee suggestion for improving process and cutting costs. You see? So if employees can, of course, contribute or su suggest new ways of doing things, because one thing is that employees are the ones in the field. They are the ones carrying out the job. So definitely, if they are allowed to suggest how things can be done well, it is, of course, a benefit to the organization itself. All right. To progress. You can see now a kind of picture from Wall Street Journal, where you can see somebody now among the employees. One is wearing a t shirt, employee of the month. You see. And we see organization, uh, you know, encouraging people through that means. Can you see? employee of the month, a t-shirt. And of course, in some organization, there could be some pack to follow that t-shirt, employee of the month. If you look at every other person there, they are not wearing a shirt. 
Now one person is wearing a shirt. That is, in fact, uh, somebody that has been recognized in terms of his or her input. That can be a source of motivation for him to repeat that. And of course, that can be a source of motivation for other colleagues that want to be like him. You see. So that is a uh, uh, recognition. Now, another, another thing that also stimulates or motivates employee is what is called employee involvement. Employee involvement program, which is of course a participative process that uses the entire capacity of employees and is designed to encourage increased commitment to the organization sources. You see. Which is part of, of course, industrial democracy that employees are given an opportunity to contribute to a decision that, that affects them, you see. And of course, from a managerial point of view, when such is done, employees are bought in, buy in, into, they buy in into their decision, can you see? Because you cannot wake up tomorrow and say, no, you are no more part of the decision that you were part of when the decision was made, can you see? So employee involvement, uh, like uh, another uh, certificate there, sometimes they may ask also in terms of uh, the best employee of, of the year, they may ask colleagues to, to, to give their views. You can see, say, I got caught smiling, who was the funniest in-suit employee that made your stay exceptional? Okay, this is now, of course, uh, asking the customers or the clients of the organization. And so this is a kind of a bed and breakfast or a kind of hotel. So they have given a questionnaire to uh, uh, people visiting the hotel. Who is the particular employee that has made you happy? You see, so some of this can, of course, uh, become a source of motivation in the workplace. Example of employee involvement program. One aspect, one of them is participative management, which is a process in which subordinates share a significant degree of decision making power with their immediate su superior. And you see the superior standing, explaining, and of course, others thinking in terms of a contribution uh, uh, to the decision that is made. All right. Examples of employee involvement program. There are several examples of involvement program. One is representation, representative participation. That is workers participate in organization decision making through a small group of representative employees. You see, and of course, when workers participate in this kind of representative participation uh, meetings. They also offer the plight of workers. They, they, they touch on issues affecting workers. And of course, they talk, they try to, of course, uh, educate management or inform management that certain decisions are not in the best interest of workers. You see? Then, of course, uh, work council. Work council is a group of nominated or elected employees who must be consulted when management makes decision involving personnel. That is personnel, that is work council, you see? It is within the organization, which is a group of nominated or elected employees who must be consulted when management makes decision, decision involving their employees or personnel. And the last one is board representative, which is a kind of form of representative participation where employees sit on the complaints board, board of directors, and represent the interest of the, uh, of the, of the, of the complaint employees. All right. Okay, yes. Example of employment involvement program will have, of course, sec, uh, quality circle, which can, of, of course, become a source of motivation. That is a one group of employees who meet regularly to discuss their equality problems 
investigate causes, and of course, uh, recommend solutions and take corrective actions, all right? That's a quality center. Employee stock option. Sometimes also employees are given opportunity to take a stock instead of giving them benefit in the organization. Company established benefit plan in which employees acquire stock as part of their benefit. Of their benefit. Now, instead of taking financial reward, employees uh, can be asked to purchase from the stock of the organization, all right? Which is stock is the shares, uh, 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 shares of the organization. So when the employee purchases share, employee become part of the owner of uh, owners of that particular organization. Uh, 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 at least, uh, they, uh, although they may not be having a lot of voting right, but somehow they are now becoming part and parcel of the organization itself. Linking. Uh, Linked employee invest, uh, involvement program and motivation theory. Uh, for instance, we have theory Y, which is of course participative management. You remember theory S says people are not wanted, people don't, do not uh, contribute as such, uh, they should be forced. But you can see theory Y that we have discussed is focused on participation. So participative uh, management is also similar to uh, what you have discussed with regards to employee involvement program, all right? And of course, uh, 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 from that, of course, employee involvement program itself, which is uh, the yellow color, two-factor theory, which is of course uh, intrinsic motivation can also be related to employee involvement program. And of course, the ERG theory, uh, employee needs, need for achievement, uh, need for power, and of course, uh, 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 the other one, uh, the third need, all of them are also tied to uh, employee uh, uh, involvement program, all right? So that is that in terms of the linkages uh, between employee, empl employee involvement programs and of course, uh, motivation theory. Now, other ways that one can, of course, uh, motivate employees within the workplace, of course, which you have touched somehow in other slides. Uh, uh, first and foremost, job rotation. Job rotation simply means the periodic shifting of a worker from one task to another. Through this process, workers know what is prevailing in another part of the department. That, of course, enable him to analyze also issues of equity or in terms of treatment and other things. You see, so when workers move from one place to the other, they gather different skills instead of working in one particular place. So job rotation is the periodic shifting of a worker from one task to another. Then the next one is job enlargement. Job enlargement. Job enlargement is of course the horizontal expansion of job. Horizontal, like I told you, is uh, 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 the letter lateral uh, 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 relationship, which is of course from equal department to equal department, you see. So for instance, if your job previously is just uh, restricted to human resources or restri restricted to benefit, now they decided to pack other additional activities uh, to you maybe marketing or purchase, you know, you can see that that is a kind of job enlargement. You are not doing more than what you normally used to do. That is, of course, the horizontal expansion of job. Now, when we talk about uh, when we talk about job enrichment, job enrichment is the vertical expansion of job. Can you see? Enlargement is the horizontal, adding more responsibility to your job from one unit to the other. Then enrichment is, of course, vertical expansion. Can you see? That is, of course, moving to the upper ladder of the hierarchy. Can you see? Expanding your job to the air uh, to the top uh, echelion of the organization. All right. So these are guidelines for enriching job, uh, 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 suggestion and action. Uh, for instance, combine uh, when you want to combine tasks. Or if you are talking about uh, 
for instance, uh, uh, combination of uh, tax. Uh, you are talking about a uh, kind of skill variety. When it comes to core job dimension, like skill variety, will require you to, of course, uh, 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 combine a lot of tax uh, so that uh, you can, of course, uh, get uh, variety in the skills that you need in executing a particular tax. And of course, uh, with regards to, of course, uh, 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 tax identity, tax identity will also require one to, of course, uh, think in terms of a combination of tax also. That is combination of tax will also require tax identity so that you can, of course, identify uh, the tax that will lead to that. Then of course, uh, create a natural, to create a natural work unit, uh, that will require, of course, uh, tax identity and of course, uh, tax uh, significance. You see? And of course, in terms of establishing client relationship, that will require skill variety, that will of course require uh, uh, task autonomy, and that will of course uh, necessitate feedback. And of course, when we talk in terms of expand job vertically, job vertically expanding it, of course, will necessitate autonomy. But you are now growing in terms of your own autonomy. And then of course, Open feedback channel, uh, open feedback channel uh, gives way to uh, feedback. You see, so these are just guidelines in terms of how to enrich a job uh, within uh, uh, the workplace. So, what can do option? There are different options. Also, that is of course uh, motivating employees. In recent time, we are hearing about flexi flexi job or flexi time which is of course employee work during a common call time period each day, but have discretion in forming their own total, total work day from a flexible set of hours outside the call, outside the call hours. Just like I was uh, discussing with my dean the other day, I bet you to understand that I'm not really an office person. Can you see? To stay in the office from uh, nine o'clock to four o'clock. That sometimes I like to go on my own secluded place and do my work. And I'm ready to understand that in fact, I prefer doing my work in the midnight, working on my research and reviewing thesis in the midnight. Now I like a quiet concentration when I do those kind of work, can you see? And that can, of course, amount to flexi time. But so one have to be disciplined, knowing fully well that, okay, the time you did not, you were not in your office, you, I, you decided to utilize extra time of your day to concentrate on those particular issues. And you see, so that is a kind of flexi time. Employee work within a common call time period each day, but have discretion in forming their total work day from a flexible side of hours outside the call. You see? And of course, we have, of course, uh, job sharing, which is, of course, a new dynamics uh, that have, of course, uh, 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 emerge within our workplace or surface within the workplace, which is, of course, the practice of having two or more people split the 40 hours. 40 hour a week job. We are seeing job sharing more also in the United States of America, where husband and wife share a job. Husband go in the morning, in the afternoon, uh, uh, and the wife look after the children. In the afternoon, the wife goes. Can you see? Well, that is a very good example of uh, job sharing. And some people are motivated to this pro uh, process. Because one thing that creates challenge for some family is that two couples that are working. You see, both of them goes to work, and when it is time to pick the children, they fight. My office refused me to leave, and so I said, "No, I'm. I, I have a patient. If the wife is a nurse or a medical doctor, so there will be argument, you know, until one of them will go and bring the children." And you see, so as a result of job sharing, people are beginning to manage some of these dynamics. 
that impact on a relationship uh, in terms of a family relationship. All right. Example of flexible schedule is there. For instance, flexible hour can be from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Then common call can be 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Then lunch can be 12 noon to 1 p.m. Then common call can be uh, uh, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And of course, flexi time can be from, of course, at 6 p.m. Time during the day, you know. It depends on how you want to actually allocate your flexi time and, of course, your common call. This is just an illustration. Now, what schedule option we have now? What is also called tele uh, telecommuting. So employees like to work electronically and telephonically. Can you see? Employees do their work at home on computer that is linked to their office. I know women like this kind of job very much. Can you see? Because women are multitasking, they have children to look after sometimes. So they stay at home and work, can you see? Probably the children are still very early, they can put them to sleep by putting them to sleep, and now they can be operating on their computer, can you see? Categories of telecommuting job include routine information handling tasks, information handling tasks, routine one, information handling tasks. And of course, another aspect is mobile activity, activities that can make one to move from one place to the other. And of course, professional and other knowledge related tasks. All this for, uh, can be uh, uh, undertaken on that telecommuting. Uh, tele uh, advantages of telecommuting. Uh, telecommuting uh, uh, for an organization, an organization can tap into a larger labor pool instead of just tapping on just those who apply. And you see, many people may like to work from home. In fact, if you open your internet now, you can see many people testifying uh, how they are making their money from home, working for big organizations. They become a kind of call centers. They become a kind of uh, 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 outsource laborers for organizations. And you see, so it's, uh, the advantage, one of the advantages is larger pool of labor is of course uh, solicited. The another advantage is higher productivity. Uh, because you are able to of course uh, obtain uh, a, a larger pool of labor and because you are able to use both permanent staff and of course uh, other staff that are telecommuting, definitely uh, that can boost productivity. And of course, because people are now working at home, and of course, people are, are enjoying both uh, their family life and of course their work life, which has reduced a kind of uh, work life conflict and br br uh, brought about more law, uh, uh, brought about more uh, work life uh, balance. Uh, definitely, it can reduce the level of uh, turnover, the level of uh, employee turnover or attrition within the organization. Then of course, another advantage is improve morale. It can boost morale of people who love that kind of job. And of course, uh, it also leads to a reduction in office spaces, office space cost. I remember some years back, my HOD was actually saying probably maybe very soon, we may reduce the office spaces in our institution to create a kind of open hall. Because as a, as a realization that not everybody come to work every day, particularly during the COVID-19, you know, people were working at home. So if you get to offices, nobody is there. Offices are quiet and empty. And this particular approach is actually already taking place in the Scandinavian countries, like, uh, of course, Finland, like uh, 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 Sweden, and some of the Scandinavian countries where they realize that academics don't actually like to be in the office all the time because sometimes most of them also are doing research in their respective research site. 
Sometimes people don't like to be in the office because of disturbances and so many other things, you know. So that is why some of the universities in the Scandinavia country have resort, resorted to this uh, approach of building a kind of uh, office hall. That is to say, when you come, you come with your laptop, you log in in any of the table in an office, uh, office hall and do your work. And after that, you can go to your respective locations and continue your work. However, the disadvantage of telecommuting include less direct supervision of employee, definitely because everybody is on in a remote uh, location. We, you cannot supervise whether employee is doing the job or not. You see? Because if employee is not following pace, why he wants to do the job, he or she may be in a rush, which can lead to low quality production, or uh, which can of course affect uh, uh, production. Another disadvantage of telecommuting is it is difficult to coordinate in work. Yeah, because everybody's working, coordination becomes a problem, you see, particularly for team. Another disadvantage of telecommuting is it is difficult to evaluate non-quantitative performance. You see, because there are quantitative performance which have to come in, in terms of figure and number, but non-quantitative non performance like quality, like commitment, like, you know, you cannot be able to evaluate such uh, under telecommuting uh, 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 arrangement, work pattern, all right? Now, other ways of motivating uh, employees could be, of course, uh, uh, something like variable pay programs, variable pay, pay program. Variable pay program, which is a portion of an employee's pay is based on some individual and or organizational measure of performance. There are different kind of pays uh, that uh, one can see. One is piece rate pay plans. The other one is profit sharing plan. And the other one is gain sharing plan. Let's see what they imply. Variable pay program continue, peace rate pay plans. And in terms of peace, pay, uh, peace rate uh, pay plan, workers are paid a fixed sum for each unit of production completed. That is a can, each of the piece that you contribute and you are rewarded according to that. Then the next one is of course profit sharing plan. That is organization program that distribute compensation based on some established formula designed around company's profitability. So if we earn profit, then we will share uh, part of the profit, you see. But there is a formula in terms of how that profit is shared. It can also be used as a way of motivating employees, you know, to do the right thing in terms of earning profit, definitely through customer satisfaction at the current trade. So another aspect also in terms of variable is uh, gain sharing. Gain sharing is a kind of incentive plan in which improvement in group productivity determine the total amount of money that is allocated for sharing, can you see? So an incentive plan in which improvement in group productivity determine the total amount of money that is allocated. Uh, for sharing. That is, of course, I can share. Now, we also have ski based pay plans. Ski based. Uh, pay, pay level are based on how many skills employees have or how many jobs they can do. Can you see? So, these are also ways of trying now to improve uh, uh, the ski varieties, the skills that are required to do a job. You remember, we said that. Uh, 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 the introduction of the factory system and the third industrial revolution depleted the skills of the craftsmen. And we're not trying to make people to have a lot of skill because of course in the current world, people should multi-skill. People should have multiple skill because people are multitasking, can you see? So pay levels are based on how many skill employees have or how many jobs they can do, can you see? So the benefit of ski-based uh, ski pay plan include provide staffing flexibility. You see, it provides staffing flexibility 
Another aspect, another benefit is that it facilitates communication across the organization. Because traffic flexibility, when you have so many skills, you can be moved from one department to the other. When uh, a particular employee is sick, you can be moved to another department to, to assist. And so that's staffing flexibility. Facilitate communication across organization. And so when people are moved from one department to the other, then you meet other people in those departments, then communication becomes easier. And so there will not be a kind of uh, organizational silo where other, some people are trying to block other people from knowing what they do. And so there'll be free flow of information and free flow of communication. So another benefit of ski based state plan is of course, lessen protection of territory behavior. I have spoken about that. Lessen the issue of uh, organizational silos or uh, functional silos, where people feel this is my territory. Let me protect it. Let other people not know what we do here. Can you see? So it lessens protection of uh, 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 territory. When people are moved from one department to the other, can you see? knowing fully well that you'll be moved back to this department. So it lessens issues of protection of uh, territory behavior. Another benefit of ski, ski based plan is that meets the need of employees for advancement. Can you see? One employee is rotated from one department to the other. He's familiar with the activities of the organization. So it prepares him for managerial position where he will be handling more than four different departments. Can you see? So but if, if an employee is concentrated maybe in the finance department and he doesn't know anything about purchase, he doesn't know anything about human resources, he doesn't, when he moves to, of course, uh, the managerial level, he'll be talking only on finance, we'll start talking about people, can you see? So meet the needs of employee for advancement. If you have different skills and you have been rotated from one department to the other because of the multiple skills that you have, can you see? So meet the need for employee advancement, can you see? Then, of course, another aspect in terms of uh, benefit of a skill based pay plan include leads to performance improvement. Yeah, it leads to performance uh, improvement, holistically or generally within an organization. All right. Now, skill based pay plan, uh, the drawback of skill based pay plan. The number one there is that lack of additional learning opportunity that will increase employee pay. So if you have all skills, there's no need again for you to go for training, can you see? So learning has stopped if you have all the skills or to do, to, so there'll be lack of additional learning opportunity that will increase employee's pay, can you see? Then of course, another one drawback of a skill pay, a skill based pay plan, is that continuing to pay employees for skills that have become obsolete. Sometimes because employees have so many uh, different skills, uh, even when that skill become obsolete, organization may still be paying uh, because the uh, uh, employee has uh, varieties of skills. Particularly within the fourth industrial revolution, and of course the uh, post COVID-19 era, you can see that so many skills are becoming obsolete. So we need new skills to remain relevant, can you see? So those who have so many other skills before, you know, may wake up to realize that their skills is no more required. Particularly in the banking sector today, you can see the, retre the retrenchment that is taking place. I remember my, the branch of my bank, when I went there, most of the colleagues in, there, in that bank that I used to know, that used to help me, they're no more there. Many of them have been retrenched or downsized. As, a, as a, a result of introduction of a lot of new technologies into the workplace, and of course, we the customers now have been asked to rely on apps in the internet in terms of our banking transactions. Can you see? So continue to pay employee. Yes. Any question? I hear somebody. No questions. Okay, okay. So 
another uh, drawback of skill-based uh, pay plan is paying for skill which are no of no immediate use to the organization. In addition to obsolete, sometimes because somebody has so many skills, other skills may not be relevant for the organization. That organization, because it's, it's a skill-based uh, pay, organizations sometimes pay uh, for skills that are not relevant for that particular organization. Number four, paying for a skill, not, not for the level of employee performance for the particular skill, paying for a skill, not for the level of employee performance, but for the particular skill, you see. So sometimes you pay for the skills that employee acquire, not really because the employee is performing, you see. So that is uh, uh, some of the drawbacks of a uh, uh, skill based pay plan. All right, flexible benefits. Flexible benefit, employees uh, benefit uh, program. Uh, uh, pro uh, employees tailor their benefit program to meet their personal need by picking and choosing from a menu of benefit option. Uh, for instance, we have what they call modular plan, which is a pre-designed benefit packages for specific group of employees. You see, pre design benefit packages for specific group of employees. Different employees uh, 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 have uh, 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 different benefit plan that can actually satisfy them or motivate them. Can you see? And of course, we have, a, of course, a, a core plus plan, which is a, a call of essential benefit and a menu like selection of other benefits. Can you see? And of course, we have a a flexible spending plan, which of course allow employees to use their tax-free benefit uh, uh, money, in this case, Namibian dollars, uh, and then purchase benefit, uh, purchase benefit and pay service premium uh, for that. So, so these are uh, all a flexible benefit plan. And of course, the manager should use the best that can of course motivate their employee uh, in terms of uh, uh, motivating them, knowing that one particular plan may not motivate another employee, uh, of course, which has, of course, motivated somebody else, you know, may not motivate another person, all right? Implication for managers. Motivating employees in organizations. Recognize individual differences, just like I have uh, mentioned now. Uh, recognize individual differences when using uh, uh, most of the theories and of course when using uh, some of the uh, 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 plans you know or some of the interventions uh, in terms of motivation use goal use goals and feedback uh, as uh, part of uh, 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 motivation uh, uh, in terms of motivating your employee but when employees know how they are performing uh, whether they are performing well or whether they are, it stimulates them also to uh, do better if they are performing well. If they are not performing well, it gives them uh, a kind of a wake up call to do better and perform uh, well. And of course, uh, allow employees to participate in decisions that affect them. Well, this is the whole essence of industrial democracy and of course, workers' participation in management. In fact, recently, my paper on workers' participation with uh, other colleagues in Nigeria and, of course, uh, one other colleague in the United Kingdom uh, has been published uh, in a journal in Romania, uh, which is known as Anas Ospiro Harit University, can you see? Which has to do with uh, uh, participation of employees with regards to safety issues in an organization. So it allows employees to participate in decisions that affect them. Can you see, when employees participate in decisions that affect them, the fee that they are part and parcel of the so, uh, solution of the organization, they feel very value, they feel very comfortable. And if they participate in a decision that affects them, it makes them take ownership of that decision. So an employee that participated in a decision that affects him or her will not wake up tomorrow to say, no, this decision is bad. When he is a part, when he is, when he or she is part and parcel of that particular decision that was taken, 
and two. So it supports at least to buy in. All right. There are another aspect is of course uh, uh, motivating employees in organization. Try your as much as possible to link reward to performance. Can you see? Of course, like in my institution, uh, uh, towards the end of the year, uh, we do our performance appraisal, and certain bonuses are given to you in terms of how you perform. You see, and we will always look forward to that, and that is how we perform because uh, definitely the amount is sometimes huge, almost uh, uh, added to your salary. Maybe it could be almost thirty thousand rand, uh, uh, which is about thirty thousand uh, uh, thirty thousand uh, uh, Namibian shilling. You know. Added to your salary and added to your, of course, uh, your, what is it called? Uh, 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 that is uh, the, the kind of uh, tatin check. Yeah, tatin check. What is uh, paid to you during your birthday? Uh, because in my institution, naturally, we used to get that money during our birthday. But somehow, uh, the institution decided that, okay, all the tatin check will be paid at the end of the year in December. So when you got about 30,000 rand or Namibian uh, dollar uh, uh, plus your 13 check, plus your salary for that, uh, uh, this thing, you see that you get a huge amount of money. Can you see? Although it is also heavily tasked because the money is big, can you see? So at least you can spend your Christmas and your New Year <laughs> with uh, a lot of, uh, Excitement, you know, uh, because uh, 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 of the bonus you receive from your performance, uh, your tatin check, and of course uh, your salary. Because your tatin check is double your salary; uh, that is uh, times your salary. So you are receiving two two salaries in addition to bonus, you know. So which is uh, something uh, uh, something beautiful, also uh, in the workplace, and of course. Uh, uh, check the system of uh, check the system for equity in order to motivate employees in organization. See that people are treated equally. That there is of course a procedural justice, and of course there is of course a equity in terms of pay. Now what you pay to A and B is equal for the same job that they perform. And also, there is, of course, a gender implication in, in terms of this. What you pay for a female, what you pay to a female worker should be same to a male worker uh, uh, if they are performing the same work. You see, because uh, over the years there have been, of course, uh, 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 a kind of research uh, uh, revolution that says that somehow men receive more pay for the same work. Uh, that they do with women, and you see, if they perform the same work, that the, the, the research has actually revealed that sometimes men are paid more than women. So that can create, create a situation of uh, inequity in the heart of the female worker, and you see, that she's not uh, fully uh, compensated. So create a state of uh, equity if you want all employees to be motivated in your organization. Thank you very much, colleagues. Is that clear? Yes, Prof. Yes, Professor. Great. Any question? Okay. Any question? Hi, Prof. Uh, Nelson. Yes. We have a question. Um, yeah, prof, prof. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite topics. Okay. Um, I think because uh, I listened to to some motivational speakers who, you know, who approached uh, or who approach it differently. Um, for instance, uh, this American, late American uh, Jim Ron, he says, uh, you know, sometimes mm. you should not spend much time and resources trying to motivate people. Perhaps mm. you should focus on uh, finding motivated people because then it saves you, yeah, all sort of, of, of it saves you in many areas. But but I also think uh, generally, Prof, my struggle at the moment is that uh, the, 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 the new society has 
just so much going on that I think we are all motivated to do different things based on where we spend our time and so on. So my quick question, Prof, is, is it really necessary to, uh, I don't know how to phrase this one, but is it necessary to get everyone to think alike in an organization or should we rather look at a situation where we still get maximum uh, work done, but not on a single motivation type of thinking. If, if, if I don't know if my question is clear, but, but I'm just saying, maybe in one line, I'm just saying, it, it seems to me today that people are motivated by many different things. The story of, of uh, industries where you have a workforce on a conveyor belt, it seems not to be the case anymore. Uh, would do we rather focus on motivated people who are out there in the market and we, we go for them, or should we still continue motivating people to work for us mm. and just for us, if that makes sense? Uh, no, basically, you see, uh, most of these uh, options that we have uh, discussed are different options that we can use in motivating people, whether they are, uh, when they are in our uh, workplace or when we hire them you know, from outside. Uh, because there is no way you can actually know who is motivated uh, among the uh, prospective uh, uh, job applicants or among the prospective workers, those who want to work for you, and you see. But when you hire them into your organization, Definitely, you have to at, at least create certain mechanisms that do continue to keep them uh, 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 motivated and, of course, contributing to the organization. Because definitely, after some years in an organization, people's uh, enthusiasm, strength, and, of course, their work pattern depletes. And you see, you see that the, 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 the power, the strength, and, of course, this can also be as a result of also aging process for employees. That is how you see that, okay, employees in his 20s, in his uh, 30s, is very productive. Now, when he start getting to that level of 50s and above, he become a senior uh, employee. The, the strength depletes, but there are certain things that can still motivate him to keep on pushing uh, to the limit, you know, pushing hard, can you see? So all these options have been given to us in order to know how to stimulate our employee under different circumstances, can you see? And of course, there are employees that are motivated by, of course, uh, money. I, I think money will be much more, uh, uh, that is a financial incentive, will be much more desired by new employee, younger employee. But as an employee advance within an organization, he wants somehow he begin to think about recognition. He begin to think about his retirement. That is after work uh, life, can you see? So the issue of money is no, not uh, so much a motivation again, because uh, definitely at this stage, his salary must have also uh, increased uh, if he's actually getting promotion in the workplace, can you see? So what he is looking for now is self-actualization. Can you see how, what will I contribute to society? And where do I belong with society? And what have I left? What have I deposited for the coming generation? Can you see, I think this becomes something that uh, people uh, begin to uh, think about. So definitely motivational speakers can come and give their own perspective. But these theories and information that have, of course, uh, 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 emanated or emerged from top experts and of course, top theorists and of course, top uh, gurus in management cannot also be totally discarded, can you see? We can, we'll continue to reflect on them and see how we can use them to improve our managerial styles when it comes to issues of motivation in the workplace. Is that clear? Um. Yes, yes, Prof. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. 
it does oh, prof uh, but i mean i mean fundamentally uh, i mean at the core of how i want my, perhaps to do things in the future is really just to say uh, you know people should motivate themselves because they know ultimately they know what they want in life I, and and then i must yeah, just build on that you know? yes you are you are making a point here people should motivate themselves which is part of self motivation and self leadership can you see self motivation is still a, is still part of the motivation uh, 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 approach uh, and of course that is also tied to uh, management by exception you know noticing those who can actually motivate themselves and allow them to motivate themselves can you see and that is also what autonomy that we have been talking about implies that you give people autonomy to do their work when you know that they can do it autonomously can you see that if somebody cannot do the work somebody there are employees that don't want autonomy they want a boss to be directing them to be guiding them how to do their work so you have to now look at the specificity of employee employees under you to see what motivates one and what uh, you can use to motivate the other can you see so most of these ideas that you have shared are just ideas that will continue to give you some thought provoking uh, mindset you know so that when you are applying even certain times you can even apply most of these things you are talking without even knowing knowing that you have applied them it becomes a subconscious aspect of your life because you have had it. And then later you go, oh, I think I came across this uh, when uh, uh, we were doing uh, uh, organizational behavior. Okay, this is exactly what Prof is saying, you know. Because I remember in those days when I was doing my uh, bachelor's, master's in uh, India, certain times we grasp a lot of knowledge and we don't know. <laughs> where it should be applied or what is other. But when you now start working and then you see them unfolding, okay, you know, this thing is almost similar to what uh, I read in the book or what I was taught in the class. And you see, so those are just keeping certain information in your mind so that when you apply the word, you realize, okay. Or if you are taking a decision, you can look at most of the possibilities that we have discussed. and attempt them in terms of uh, resolving certain issues. If it works, then of course uh, you have uh, apply your knowledge. Uh, if it didn't work, you can explore other aspects that, uh, among all the uh, varieties of uh, information that you have, all right? And you remember when we spoke about also uh, perception, we spoke about the fact that of course uh, there are, uh, uh, when, you, when people take decisions, there are instances where you can take a rational decision step by step, but there are instances where you can utilize intuition. And of course, there are instances where you just gather a few information that you know and satisfies yourself that, okay, I will take the decision on the basis of this. Now you see, so there are so many options that are given to us in terms of how to handle or manage people within the workplace. And in this regard, uh, uh, in terms of uh, motivation within the workplace. All right. Is that clear? Is that clear, colleague? Yes, yes, bro. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you, bro. Thank you very much. All right. Let me see whether uh, the video, some of the videos can show uh, that uh, uh, I will share a video with you guys on this uh, platform. Let me see. There are uh, there are some uh, uh, there are some some of these uh, network or uh, presentation uh, network that doesn't allow video. But let me see whether our video can share here. All right.
So what do I know about change? First thing I know is that everybody is afraid of something. Everybody is afraid of something. All of you are afraid of something. Um, Prof, uh, I think you might want to share your screen. You can't see. Are you seeing the video? Some people are held okay, back. Okay, there we go. Okay, so we can share with you here. Okay, listen. So what do I know about change? First thing I know is that everybody is afraid of. Change. Just keep it in mind. This is just a preamble related to change. Uh, uh, since change is not a, a, a particular topic on your on your syllabus, like I told you, I may add it if I have time. But let's just listen to uh, uh, Khalid uh, Firona uh, in terms of uh, uh, her, her perspective with regards to change and, of course, leadership. All right. So what do I know about change? First thing I know is that everybody is afraid of something. Everybody is afraid of something. All of you are afraid of something. All of us are afraid of something. What distinguishes people who are successful in their life from those who are not is what do you do with your fear? Some people are held back by their fears and some people choose to move ahead in spite of fear. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is acting in spite of fear. But because everybody is afraid, what most of the time people are afraid of is something new. The essence of entrepreneurship is risk taking. The essence of business is risk taking. Taking a risk is all about trying something new. And yet as people go on in their lives, they become afraid of trying something new. And so change is always resisted, always. Because people are afraid. Even if what they have is not satisfying to them, a lot of people are afraid to venture into the unknown. And that holds them back from change. And if you are trying to drive a company, an organization, your colleagues towards change, you have to know that they are afraid. And you have to know as well that the only way you can help people get over their fear is to give them a vision of something that's worth striving for, that's worth taking a risk. But the other reason change is always resisted is because the natural momentum, the natural instinct of any institution, any institution, I don't care if that institution is a family, a board, a university, a company of five people or 500,000 people. Today, one of the many very interesting things that I do is I chair the advisory board for the Central Intelligence Agency. And so I can say without fear of contradiction that this is true of government or agencies, everybody. The natural momentum of any organization is to preserve the status quo. Why? Because people who have positions of power and influence want to keep them. And so they invest their energies in maintaining their position of power and influence. This isn't because people are bad. It's just human nature. And so, again, if you are focused on risk taking, change, you have to understand that the momentum that works against you is the power of the status quo. And it's always there. That's why change is hard. And the other force that pushes against change is fear, basic human fear. And so, change has to have enough power the power of the vision about what can be different. It has to have enough force and enough energy to overcome people's fears and to overcome the power of the status quo. All right. Have you learned anything from that? Hello, colleagues. Hello, professor. You saw what? Yeah, we learned something. Oh, I learned something. Okay. Thank you very much. 
Uh, what is just Can we have the full, the full conversation of the, of the You say you want to have the full conversation? Yes, like if there's a link or something. Oh, okay. Uh, definitely, I will see possibility of attaching it to your e-learning platform. Okay, okay, Professor. Yeah. Yeah, it's from uh, Stanford, Stanford University. All right. Great. Okay. Let me see possibility of uh, other uh, videos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How does it feel having three of your students getting their PhD today? Well, uh, I'm really <laughs> excited about it, and uh, I think uh, it's all the good of the Lord, the uh, support of God. We can see that the good of the Lord. Okay, okay, I'm coming. There's one thing that all three of them said, and that was that they were very lucky to have you as a supervisor because of the kind of support that you gave. I'm coming. Uh, How does it feel having three of your students getting PA, their PhDs today? Well, uh, I'm really <laughs> excited about it. And uh, I think uh, it's all the will of the Lord. Uh, it's a of God on my side. Uh, most of Mm. There's one thing that all three of them said, and that was that they were very lucky to have you as a supervisor because of the kind of support. Yes, How does it feel having three of your students getting PA their PhDs today? Well, uh, I'm really <laughs> excited about it, and uh, I think uh, it's all the good of the Lord. Uh, there's one thing that all three of them said, and that was that they were very lucky to have you as a supervisor because of the kind of support that you gave them was impeccable. Wow, what comment can you give on that? Well, I should have known that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, uh, since it's coming from the horse's mouth, mm -hmm. well, uh, I will also thank them uh, because uh, they were submissive, mm -hmm. ready to learn, they were humble students. Uh, there was no time of uh, moment for agitation or dispute between us. I think that is the most important thing in terms of an Professor is blushing. Yeah. <laughs> and you form good relationships with them. Of course, good relationships. And of and course, my life is all about good relationships. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Now you have more PhDs to add to your contact list. <laughs> Certainly, I'm all fine enough, and we look forward to that. And at least uh, this is now, uh, this will now be my sixth PhD candidate graduating, uh, working on the stage. And uh, of course, about, uh, about 10 uh, masters working on the stage. So, only more, probably about 16 of them uh, I have graduated. So That's I'm incredible. Getting, I'm, get, I'm getting old in the system. <laughs> You're becoming someone who's an expert in helping people graduate with their PhD. And I think that's something that's that's very, it's a very prestigious qualification to have. I think not something that you can put on paper. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Dr. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, those are the things that uh, I tell you just encourage us as academics when we see you guys graduate. So I look forward to when you guys will be graduating also. So that is why you have to come out in the flying color because that is one thing that gives us excitement and one of our students succeed. All right. Okay. Professor, you could see this happening when we graduate <laughs> as well. Definitely. Can, can be my mentor. Can, can the professor what? be my mentor? 
I'm already your mentor by teaching you a course. I'm already your mentor. You can always hit on me. <laughs> I have so later. much to, you, not to graduate. You say what? Yeah, I'm hearing you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just, just to say, like, uh, it it will be good if professor can be like a mentor because right now I have fear of not graduate. No, you 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 must graduate. <laughs> you must graduate. Okay. Uh, just a minute. just thinking about the, the connection, um, uh, even as uh, our beloved Nelson Mandela lies in hospital, uh, because I think he did that. So and that was my that. inaugural address as so a food professor. Uh, just, I just want to give you a little so caption of this, not a I hope you want to but I will refer you to where you can go to. Again to see. Professor, 
Daniel van Dill, Executive Dean of uh, the Faculty of Management, okay. Professor Theo Felsman, Head of Department, Professor Wilford Oplere, the person whose inaugural has convened us here today. I note in our midst several other important visitors. I was made to understand that my good friend, Professor Larry Obi, DVC Academic Affairs from the University of Porter is here. Is he here? Hey, my friend, welcome. It's good to see you. I also want to acknowledge uh, in our midst, uh, Professor Hert Ruot, uh, Dean of Research in the Faculty of Management, uh, Professor Jane Sport, uh, Dean of Teaching and Learning, uh, Dr. Gottlieb Otto and his wife, they come all the way from the University of uh, Port Harcourt in Nigeria. Welcome. I want to welcome Professor Vena Habenka from the Northwest University. Professor Jan Fisahi, also from the Northwest University. Uh, Mr. Marius Meyer and his wife, who is the CEO of the South African Board of People Practices. Uh, Mr. Christopher Mfieme, who is uh, also in our midst. From the Upere family, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Mrs. Celestine Upere, uh, wife of uh, uh, Professor Wilfred's late uh, brother and uh, her late uh, daughter. Um, Mrs. Maria Upere also should be in our midst. And then uh, closer to home, Mrs. Gladys Upere, the wife of Professor Wilfred Upere, uh, Miss Helen Upere, the daughter, as well as the three sons, uh, Wilfred, William, and Wintley. Uh, it's a family where the men dominate, very <laughs> patriarchal family. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Diniko Maluleke. I am the DVC Internationalization, Advancement, and Student Affairs at the University of Johannesburg. It is my singular pleasure to welcome you to UJ, an international university of choice anchored in Africa, dynamically shaping the future. You will agree with me that in the life of a scholar or an academic, few occasions are as significant as the occasion of professorial inauguration. In as much as it is often said colloquially that life begins at 40. For scholars and academics, one could say life begins at the moment when one becomes a professor. It is the moment when one's peers and one's colleagues acknowledge one's scholarly maturity, a moment when peers agree that one has something original, something scholarly to profess, a moment when one's university is willing to lend one the unique and special title of professor. Although I see that nowadays there are DJs who call themselves professors. <laughs> the University of Johannesburg, recognizing the production of knowledge as its ultimate contribution to society, its ultimate value add, is very proud to unveil today its newest professor, that being none other than Professor Wilfred Uper. And it is now my pleasure to request the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Management to step forward to introduce Pro Professor Wilfred Uper to us before he addresses us. Professor Bandil. Professor Maruleke, honored guests, it's wonderful to be here this evening. 
And it really takes me back to two of the most wonderful moments in my life. Whenever there was a graduation, when I was an undergrad, I always looked at the doctoral candidates entering the hall. And I always wondered, what is this about? How does it feel? And that day when I wore that particular gown, it felt as though I conquered the world. And then afterwards, when my academic career started, I realized, oh, shucks, in this place, everybody's got a doctorate. There's nothing funny about it. And then the real hard work started. And then eventually I, I said, now, how can you progress? And this is what you need to do to become a professor one day. And I thought, oh, my goodness. This will take me probably 2,600 years, but nonetheless, let's give it a try. And then eventually that evening when I gave my inaugural address, it was one of the highlights. And I was wonderful because my family was also there. And it's, it's a, so, Wilfred, I think the point is, in mind, in heart, and in spirit, we are with you and your loved ones tonight to celebrate this remarkable achievement and to witness this great step in your career journey. It's wonderful to have all of you tonight with us. And thank you for all our guests and our peers and our colleagues who are visiting tonight and are sharing the moment with us. Dear colleagues, it gives me an absolute, it's me an absolute pleasure to introduce to you a remarkable scholar, somebody who gives a lot of love to the world and aspires to make it a better place, uh, Professor Wolford Isoma Uppel. Now, Professor Wolford Isoma Uppel attended school in Nigeria before proceeding to India for his advanced studies. He obtained his Bachelor of Commerce and Master's of Commerce from Punjabi University in Patila, India. He further obtained another master's in business administration from Jiwaji University in Gwalior, India, and subsequently obtained his doctorate in human resource management from the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town. Wilfred has more than 14 years of cognitive industrial, academic, and research experience. He has worked at the Radical Pharmaceutical Company in India, the Central Institute of Management in Ambala, the Central Bank of Nigeria in Abuja and the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in Cape Town, where he lectured and served as head of department entrepreneurship and business management. He demonstrates a keen sense of responsibility towards his students and his contribution to the development of young academics through mentorship is well acknowledged and really appreciated. Wilfred is currently a professor in the Department of Industrial Psychology and People Management at the University of Johannesburg. He contributes a strong theoretical approach in his research, with most of, most of his output centered on critiquing the impact of capitalism in the post-Cold War era, notably in the context of emerging economies. His referees consider him to be an established researcher in the field of people management and development, notably within the domain of globalization and its impact on human resources management. He has authored three books, two book chapters, 25 conference proceedings, and more than 100 articles in ISL, IBSS, and DOE accredited journals. Now, for some of you, this may just sound like jargon, but in our life as academics, if you deliver about five credits per year as a professor, five to six, we consider this as great. Last year, Professor Perry contributed 18.33 credits to the faculty's output, and this is remarkable. <laughs> and uh, with that, we will also later this year acknowledge our full professor as one of the top researchers in the faculty. Uh, Wilfred Perry is also an NLF rated researcher. This means the National Research Foundation's uh, ratings, and he has received numerous research related awards in recognition of his research contributions from the CPUT, UJ, NLF and the Yona College in the USA. Wilford demonstrates an ability to secure vital, vital partnerships with local and international research collaborators, particularly in India and Northern Africa. He serves on the research committee of the Human Resource Research Initiative of the SA Board of People Practices. And Maurice, great to have you and the team here tonight. Um, he also acts as an external examiner for postgrads and as an external moderator for several universities. He's a visiting academic to several international institutions, such as Punjabi University in Patalia, India, Spiro Herat University in Romania, the University of Cologne in Germany, the University of Port Harcourt, the University of Benin, the University of Lagos, and Convent University in Ottawa. He served as a scientific reviewer for several academic journals and international conferences. 
He is an editorial advisory board member for several academic journals, including the International Journal of Social Economics, it's the Emerald Insight Journal, and the Journal of Communication, Kamla Raji. He is the chief editor of the Journal of Management and Technology, editor-in-chief of the African Journal of Business Management, and currently the co-editor of South Africa's Journal of Human Resources Management. He is married to Gladys, and it's so good to meet you tonight and the family, uh, who is a chief professional nurse and a midwife, and they have four children, Helen, Wilfred, Williams, and Whitley. And I must tell you guys, the first time that I met, met your dad, uh, we were speaking in his office, and we spoke about 15 minutes about his work and about him joining you, Jane, and for more than an hour about you guys. So, Gladys, to you and the family, kids, thank you very much for supporting him through the years, and thank you for availing his time to us so that we can grow a new generation. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute pleasure to introduce you to Wilfred Perry. <laughs> Professor Gali, and uh, I would also like to begin by thanking uh, our new PBC, uh, Professor Maduleke. You are welcome, and I'm privileged to have you as uh, associated VC tonight. And also, I would like to also thank uh, Professor uh, Quincy, my very good friend and uh, for the most uh, stubborn and crazy professor in my department. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, thank you and, uh, <laughs> for, going, for going along with me tonight. And uh, I'd also like to thank uh, my head of department, uh, that is uh, Professor Gio Bexman, uh, who has been so supportive as uh, my head. Uh, and uh, all colleagues, friends that are gathered here tonight, I say thank you very much. I'm very, very happy and pleased to have you here because I know that you have so many other important things to be doing by this hour that you decided to boycott most of those activities to be here with me tonight. Thank you once more. Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of this inaugural address, I would like to uh, dedicate this inaugural address to uh, my my dad, uh, that is my parents, that is Mr. and Mrs. J. Uh, J. N. Murray. Uh, my dad uh, has been an inspirator in so many ways to me. And uh, I'm also dedicating this inaugural address to my senior brother, late senior brother, Mr. Matthew Bijama Murray. And the wife is here. He has been my mentor also uh, during my study days in India. I would also like to uh, dedicate this inaugural address to my loving wife, uh, Gladys, and my four children, uh, Helen, Wilfred, Williams, and Wendy. <laughs> Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I, I will begin by saying that all activities under heaven are heavenly ordained. The present author standing before you is a fine product of a divine grace. Fulfillment in life is not being passive, and co but comes about when one contributes to making the world a better place, not by chance, but by hard effort through the special grace of God. Therefore, I dare say today that I am not standing here on my own account but through the mercy and love of my maker, who inspired me to pursue my dreams and also touch people's hearts, to enable me to stand where I stand today. The inaugural nature, although perceived and at times conceived as the peak of an academic career, is in part the beginning, like Professor Van Lake just said that, the beginning of an academic endeavor based on some medieval facts. Professor Inaugura, which is also referred to as Inceptio, is more than 800 years as a university tradition. It has been presented by different people or by different academics over the years in different formats, such as speeches, lectures, addresses, experimentation, and some kind of significant insights. 
So then man will take the form of a ledger, a speech, an, ad, and an address. My lecture is based on a concept, Stropilomena, which confronted me while pursuing my master's degree in India, and also stayed with me when I decided to embark on my doctoral studies in Cape Town. It is a phenomenon that has brought both exciting and depressing perspectives to my talks. I'm referring to a phenomenon that is pervasive, as well as confusing, polarizing, and sometimes destructive, namely globalization in pure capitalist form. You are most welcome on board. The collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989 and the fall of the famous Berlin Wall heralded a new liberal economy system known as globalization, which was postulated to address the problem of humankind on a global scale. This development saw nations, particularly developing ones, rushing to infuse themselves into the capitalist global system, which was reflected by the opening of borders to the transnational juggernaut of capitalism. In the Turner reports, the late 1990 and the first half of 2000 marked the apogee of a sort of market triumphalism a confident at least among Western allies that capitalism, and in particular, American free market capitalism was the universal answer to economic problems. This specific capitalism bears little resemblance to the earliest one, hence full-blown global capitalism appeared after the defeat of contending ideologies in Russia, Eastern Europe, and other parts of the world. Claire declares, by the early 1990s, ruling groups in all the countries of Eastern Europe had abandoned communism and were trying in a variety of ways to insert themselves into the capitalist global system. Thus, as previously predicted, capitalism broke all walls of resistance and penetrated societies and nations as never before imagined. Even nations such as India and China, which were one time sworn enemies of pure capitalist system, finally succumbed to the political ideology of capitalism. After years of trade restriction and protectionism, followed by a series of euphemistic economic policies, the Chinese government finally decided to liberalize and open up its borders to the transnational forces of capitalism. The same can be said of India as advanced of times. By the 1990s, even an Indian government claiming economic nationalistic credentials had succumbed to the economic transnational practices of capitalist globalization and had opened up its economy. During the same period, a French the French socialist government privatized more state assets in four years than any government had done previously in economic history. The successes that were achieved in the, then in the USA, Britain, and other nations that embraced the capitalist system and the weak performances by nations that adopted its alternative gave powerful credence so the notion that neoliberal capitalism was the best of all options. In other words, capitalism was highly acknowledged as the best and only option to propel any global economic agenda. Even the present author can still recall being cautioned a few years ago by a colleague, Professor Brown Rust, at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology his statement could be dangerous when he revived. There could still be the possibility of a complementary relationship between capitalism and socialism. 
The silent moment of a particular system should not be construed as the end of that system. Otherwise, a battle line could be drawn, and it may as well not be congruous to accept that positive socialism locked at the corner, waiting to mock the circumstantial, inexplicable form of capitalism. In another peer review academic engagement, Professor Mike Busasi seemed to concur with Professor Ross' reservation when he queried, would violent conflict, terrorism, and intensification of anti-globalization demonstration not be the natural fallout of the uneven or lopsided gain of capitalism rather than the revival of positive socialism as predicted in the study? Would the predatory resurgence of positive socialism and not another ideological confrontation between capitalism and socialism as claimed in the study? This is clearly an impossible Hence, the skepticism of these eminent scholars may not be incredible since the obligation was high for capitalism as the only goals that lay the golden head. Indeed, a victory, at least, for Reaganomics and Thatcherism, which gave birth to Tina. When I talk about Tina, I'm not referring to anybody called Tina here, or my sister Tina. It's just an acronym for there is no alternative. No alternative to capitalist global system. Just for almost in conformity with earlier predictions, other alternative economic configurations were irrevocably declared dead. The Rindra states, the point has to be made unequivocally that socialism is dead and that none of its virus can be revived for a world awakening from the double nightmare of sterilism and bourgeoisism. Giddens assert that the idea of barren socialism has become a reality. Slavic states, the Russian beer is dead and buried. Plundering in its wake is a confederation of state desperately trying to come to grip with a market economy. Two of the mourners at the funeral, Comrade Mars and Lee, were seen wearing expressions of astonishment and bitterness. Dissolution by the fading out of one of the world's primary ideologies. In the United States and certain other capitalist nations, the triumph of capitalism was greatly celebrated, culminating in Francis Fakuyama's position that the triumph of capitalism over other alternative economic systems marked the end of history. However, Harvard professor Samuel Huntington believes that the scenario could best be captured by the clash of civilization. In his view, the future will be decided by, not by a confrontation between social theories and political orders, as in the days of the Cold War, but by conflict of religious and cultural origin between civilization. The above assertion could presumably be linked to the current resistance in many parts of the world as presently witnessed in Iraq, Iran, North Korea, Afghanistan, and Somalia, although these were considered by the present author as pockets of resistance in the face of total triumphant capitalism. Hence, to a great extent, capitalism became so unchallenged, so sort of a demigod, god, implying that the world is left without alternative but to freely accept the total and final echoes of other economic systems by American free market capitalism, which implies that those positive moral incentives of socialist systems, such as free education, minimum wage, employment creation, social welfare, and security, unemployment benefits, government housing construction, progressive transition of age allowances, to mention a few, become relics of a bygone era to be confined to the door. All right, colleagues, if you want to watch the remaining part of the video, you can just uh, type uh, Wilfred Ukmere inaugural address or inauguration on Google. Uh, you will get the full video if you type my name on Google.
And you can get so many other videos of my presentations across the globe or in different uh, places if you want to watch some additional videos of my uh, lecturing and of course uh, uh, my presentation at conferences. Some of the conferences are uh, already also in the internet also. Thank you very much colleagues. Uh, it's now uh, 10 after 12. Uh, you can uh, at least uh, have a very long uh, lunch break. Uh, let's meet by say uh, in one hour time, by say around uh, uh, 15 after one. Is that okay? Like uh, quarter past one? Quarter past one, yeah. Let's yes, meet. Professor. Yeah, in fact, let's meet by 1.30 to give yeah, ourselves okay. more, much time to stretch ourselves. Let's meet by 1.30. Is that clear? All right, Prof, thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very thank much. You, Bye. Bye.